see about each other, encourage one another, and help one another. And we ought to be about that. As a matter of fact, when Jesus Christ told his apostles in John chapter 13, just literal hours before he was crucified, and he told them that their love, or their revealed love, their, um, their demonstrated love, their charity toward each other, the love that they showed to each other, was how men would know that they were disciples of Jesus Christ. So the way we're recognized as children of God is how we treat each other, and how we show love to each other and obedience to the Lord. Over the past several weeks, we've endeavored to speak to you concerning our spiritual warfare. Um, one Sunday, we just took that as the subject by itself, our spiritual warfare, to, in an effort to show that the Bible does teach that we are engaged in a spiritual warfare. It's a battle, a war. We have individual battles, but there is a war ongoing and has been going on ever since Jesus Christ uh, uh, was born. Because even at his birth, the warfare was there. The authorities sought to uh, destroy him even as a child. The war still rages. Last Sunday, we endeavored to speak to you concerning the weapons that our enemy has. Your adversary, the Antichrist, the false prophet, the false preachers, false teachers, those who hate Jesus Christ and hate his gospel and hate his church, they are there. There are those who literally hate Jesus Christ and the teachings of Jesus Christ and his word. And they would do everything in their power to destroy you, the word of God, the church of Jesus Christ, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. They do everything they can to wipe the mention of his name out of public sight. We indeed have a warfare to fight. But our God would never put a soldier into battle without equipping him to fight. This morning, the Lord be pleased like to speak to you concerning the weapons of our warfare. I'd like to begin reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 1. Paul says, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you. Now that phraseology there places weight upon what he's about to say. And that was, in my down-home country way of speaking, that was saying, now y'all need to pay attention to this. When he says, now I, Paul, myself beseech you, that's the down-home, my down-home way of saying, you need to pay attention to this. Now watch what he says. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, speaking of the loveliness of our Lord, do you know Jesus Christ was such a meek and a gentle man as he was perceived? that you could just walk right up to him. He was such a gentle and a meek man in the way he presented himself, the children loved to be near him. Women who were diseased would seek just to get close enough to him just to touch the hem of his garment. They'd call out to him as he passed by, Jesus of Nazareth, have mercy upon us. And he would. You can't be so low of what this meek and gentle Savior won't reach down to you. You can't be so troubled of what he won't come to your aid. You know, there's troubles in this life that we consider just to be beyond our ability. You, you've, I've had people call me and explain their situation to me, and I, I, I understood that it was bigger than me. But let me tell you something. This meek and gentle Savior has never faced a trouble bigger than him. There's never a mountain he can't climb. There's never a schism so great he can't cross it. Never a foe so mighty that he cannot conquer. So Paul says, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence on uh, uh, and base among you, he says, when I, when, I, when I was there, then, you know, I, I didn't stand out. In the crowd, I didn't present myself as something uh, grand and glorious, but being absent and bold to you, toward you, he says, I'm not there, so I'm, I'm writing with great boldness to you. You know, Paul is emphasizing this because he said that I need to get your attention. And I'm afraid that it's time that the children of God have their attention gotten nowadays. 
He says, but I beseech you, this is the second time he says that, but I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some. He says, I want you to listen to what I'm saying. I beseech you to hear and obey so that when I come to see you, then we won't have to talk in such strong terms. I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Paul says, I want you to understand that I do what I do not on the strength of my flesh. That's important for us to know. That's the opening for what he's about to say. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, we walk in flesh and bone bodies, we do not war after the flesh. He says, these bodies are limited. The flesh is weak, isn't it? I mean, we, we will fail. These bodies will give out. We'll get tired. We'll get sick. We'll get old. These bodies will fail. He says, but that's not how we fight this war, based upon the strength of these bodies. Not even, not even the strength of our minds. He says, for the weapons of our warfare, which is our subject this morning, Lord willing, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That means... Our weapons are not natural weapons, meaning they're not weak the way we are. You know, <clears throat> a weapon is what you go into battle with, with the hope of defeating your adversary. Now he says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, it's not natural weapons. You don't go into battle, a spiritual battle, with a rifle, with a knife, with a club, or with a sword. But Paul uses the analogy of these things so that we might understand how we go into battle and the gravity of it. You do have weapons. And I want you to understand that this morning. God has given you weapons enable, to enable you to fight this spiritual warfare. Remember we talked about some of the devil's weapons? And one of his greatest weapons was discouragement, anger, hatred. He just gets in among the children of God and creates a disturbance. Those are weapons, tools that he has. But we are thoroughly equipped. We have sufficient weapons to defeat him. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Meaning, it's not weak as our flesh is. You know, I, I have a rifle, and I can't tell you how many times I've missed my target with that rifle. I've been deer hunting and had the rascal right there in my sights and pulled the trigger and saw the, the round hit the ground. I've done that a many times. And I thought, what in the world if I was trying to defend my life like that? There's another aspect about our weapons. A soldier takes care of his weapon because that's his lifeline. He keeps that weapon clean. He keeps it lubricated. He keeps it adjusted. He keeps it sighted in so that when he goes into battle, it's ready to go. We can understand that principle. In the kitchen, whatever tools you have in the kitchen, you keep them up, do you not? One of my favorite tools in the kitchen is a crock pot. When Sarah's away, it's a crock pot. Believe you me, I take good care of that crock pot because if that crock pot were to fail, then I'd go hungry. You know, our automobile is a tool. And we keep our automobiles up because if we get in during the key, we want it to go. Don't, don't we? You know, sometimes we don't want, don't want it to go as much as it does, but we want it to go, don't we? And so you lubricate it, you keep the tires up and uh, re replaced and keep the oil changed and uh, all of those things. You re when something goes wrong, uh, breaks, you, you, you repair it because that's your tool, isn't it? That's something you use in life. Now, this church building is, is, is a tool, in a sense, to facilitate our meeting. We want to keep the building up, keep the grounds up. We want it to, uh, if something breaks, we want to repair it because this is where the church meets. The weapons of our warfare are that way. God gives us the weapons, 
And he expects us to keep those weapons up. And we'll come to that aspect of it in a moment. But I want you to notice concerning the weapons that God gives you, the weapons of our warfare. Those are some things that, that Paul says about it. He says, for the weapons of our warfare, first of all, they're not carnal. Everything that we have, all those things I mentioned, um, we've burned up crock pots. Okay? Cars have just simply given out on the road. Uh, they break down. On this trip up to North Georgia, I, can't, I cannot tell you how many automobiles I saw on the side of the road that were broke down. And tires go flat. The things happen to it. But let me tell you something. The weapons that God gives to you, they will never fail. We fail, but they won't ever fail. So he says they're not carnal. They're not weak like, like we are. He's, you, know, you know the reason I know that they're not weak like we are? Because I had to get discouraged. Do you get discouraged? Can problems just get so bad and maybe sickness and, and our family problems and this problem comes and, and all of a sudden you get to the point where you just like you want to throw up your hands? Do you ever, am I the only one that gets that way? Well, that's because we measure our success against those problems by our natural flesh. Your success over those problems is not dependent upon your strength, but what Paul said in Philippians 4 and 13 tells us how. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. He said, that, that's, that is the Lord said, I give you weapons. And my weapons don't fail. You fail. Your weapons fail. But I don't fail. So he goes on. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. Mighty. God is referred to in the Bible, in both the Old and the New Testaments, as the Lord of hosts. We won't chase all those down this morning. But the Lord of hosts. Uh, as a matter of fact, in uh, Romans chapter 9, through a transliteration, it comes to us as Sabaoth, meaning the Lord of hosts. The mighty God. And the picture that paints should be painted in our mind is a great military commander riding at the head of a great army behind him. That's the word, the phrase, the Lord of hosts ought to create that kind of picture in the mind. That the Lord comes riding into town, mighty, glorious, all-powerful, and no nation, no army, no adversary can stand against him. That's your God. Isaiah 63 paints that picture. And who is, you know, the city asks, who is this that cometh from Edom? And, and you, let, let's, let's look at that real quick. Isaiah chapter 63. It's a picture of your Lord coming into town, mighty and ready to fight and always winning. Isaiah chapter 63 and verse number 1. As this mighty warrior, the Lord, Lord of hosts, comes riding into the city, the city turns out, they see him coming. This is Isaiah 63 and verse number 1. This is what the city says. Who is this? He is so magnificent. He's so mighty, so powerful, so glorious. Who is this that cometh from Edom? That's where the battle has been fought. With dyed garments from Bozrah. There's been a battle in Bozrah. Who is this that's coming from Bozrah? That is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of of his strength. He's a mighty king. He's a mighty warrior. He's the Lord of hosts. Well, just who is he? And then this mighty warrior, the Lord of hosts, speaks back to the city and says, I that speak in righteousness. What's the next phrase? Mighty to save. And that is across the board. You know, there's salvation in this time world. There's salvation in time. There's salvation in this life from the uh, troubles and the, the, uh, the terrible things of this life. And there's also eternal salvation. That mighty to save is across the board. When the Lord God Almighty is on the battlefield, I'm telling you that victory is assured. He has never lost a battle, and he'll never lose a battle. So he says... I that speak in righteousness, that means everything that I say is right. Wouldn't it be great if everything you said was right, or everything that was said to you was right? Wouldn't that be wonderful? But let me tell you, the only one that can claim that truth is Jesus Christ. Everything he said, says, is right. For he's the God that cannot what? Lie. So he says, I that speak in righteousness... 
He says, I am mighty to save. That word mighty means all powerful. I'm empowered so that I can deliver. I don't care how great the trouble is. Well, just how great can your troubles get? All right, let's go back to Daniel. And let's ask Daniel just how great can the troubles get? The, he was thrown into the, uh, some phrase it, the lion's den, but the text says the den of lions. And these den of lions, the way they treated them, they didn't give them anything to eat for several days. Daniel was thrown in to that den of lions. And you know what? The lions did him no harm. Amazing, isn't it? The next morning the king came out and he says, Oh, Daniel. He must have had some feeling inside of him that Daniel would answer his call. Oh, Daniel, is your God able? And you know what? Daniel said, oh, king, live forever. Now, meaning that I'm still here, king. Everything's all right, king. And so the king cooked David out of that den of lions. And then those men who laid a trap for David, he threw them in there. And the lions immediately consumed them. My friends, my God is mighty to save. Then those three Hebrew uh, children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the same kind of thing. They were thrown in the fiery, uh, the fiery furnace. And you know what they told Nebuchadnezzar uh, when they were allowed to throw him in? He said, you just go ahead and throw us in there, but we're not going to bow down to your king, uh, your gods. We're just not going to do that. For the God that we serve, you know, he's going to deliver us from you. And he's able to deliver us even if you throw us in this fire. Do you know that? They knew that if they threw them in the fire and they died, they were still delivered. They were delivered to heaven. Isn't that a good attitude to have? If I die, I'm still delivered. How about that? That is a, that is a weapon that your adversary cannot take for you. That even if you die on the battlefield, you're delivered from this uh, life to a place that the Lord called what? Paradise. My friends, that is a win-win situation, isn't it? Now watch this. This great warrior says, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. That means there's nobody that can stand against me. Then the city asked him, Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? They said, you, you got, what's this red stuff on your uniform? Oh, you, you, you've been out tonight, oh, oh mighty king. What is that red stuff? Did you get wounded out there? Well, there was a time when he did get wounded, but that's not this blood. Watch this. He says, I have treading the wine press alone. He says, when you, you couldn't fight the battle, uh, you couldn't help me. So I went out there and I fought and you couldn't fight. He says, I have trodden the wine press alone. And of the people, there was none with me. For I will tread them in my anger and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled where? On my garments. And I will stain all of my He says, when I come home... With their blood on my uniform, you know that I have gotten the victory. I have won. I'm the Lord of hosts. Their blood on my uniform tells the story that I got the victory. Let me tell you something. Your Savior, your Master, your Lord gets the victory every time. He's never lost a battle. What about Gideon? What about Gideon? Remember Gideon? The, the judge Gideon? And the Lord came, uh, the angel came to, to Gideon and, and referred to him as a, as, as a mighty man. And, and Gideon said, are you talking to me? You can't be talking to me. This is a man who had many doubts. And you know how he went through the doubts with the fleece, the wet, the dry fleece? And then when he got out there, he had something like 20,000 soldiers. And the Lord uh, told everybody that's, uh, that, that's frightful to go home and left 10,000. And then he uh, did the lap test, and, and then uh, uh, only 300 passed the lap test, and, and the rest went home. And, and so he went into battle against a great host, an enemy uh, that, that covered the field like grasshoppers. He went out there to, uh, to that battle with 300 men, a jug, a light, and a trumpet. And remember, when they got on that hill out there, and the enemy was before, below them. There's a lot more to this story, but I'll just, I just want to hit the highlights. And they were on the crest of the hill around, around that great enemy. And when, upon his command, you know, they, uh, they, broke, they broke the jugs, they held the lanterns up, and they blew the trumpet. And that made the enemy think that there was 
thousands upon thousands of enemy soldiers around. But do you remember what their cry was on that hymn? They gave a cry on that hymn. They said, the sword of Gideon and the sword of the Lord. The sword of the Lord is on this hill. And with the sword of the Lord on that hill, victory was assured. Let me tell you something. I don't care what your problem. I do care. But with respect to your victory, it makes no difference. If God is on the battlefield with you, you're going to win. Every time. Sometimes it looks bad. It looked bad. It looked bad for the children of Israel at the Red Sea, didn't it? But they won. It looked bad uh, for Gideon, didn't it? It looked bad for Daniel. It looked bad for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But they won. It looked bad for David when he went up against Goliath. What, what prospect would you have given David that he would have defeated Goliath? Now, speaking from a natural sense, and you were sitting there watching this, do you suppose that you would have thought that David was going to destroy that uh, Goliath? No. Because we measure our success by our own natural human ability. But Paul is saying, that's not how you really measure success. You measure success by who is on the battlefield with you and the weapons that he gives you. So back to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. He says, but they're mighty through God. God Almighty. God all power. You know, I, I, want, I want to trust that one more time. I believe in the eternal sovereign God. And that God is omnipotent. The word omnipotent means that he has all power. He has no limit. He never has a knee problem, okay? His elbows don't ever get sore. And he never misses the target, okay? I miss the target. He never misses the target. Now, if you don't leave here with any other thing uh, today, I want you to leave here with the confidence that your God never misses the target. That means he is totally, entirely effective on the battlefield of life. Okay? So he says, but he's, he's, the, 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 we're mighty through God. The weapons are mighty through God to pull down strongholds. All right? Let's look at a stronghold, a physical stronghold. Remember when Joshua led the children of Israel across the flooded Jordan River? Let's go back to the river. You know when they crossed that river, it was flooded? Now, for the sake of time, we're not going to go back and read it all this morning, but that river was flooded, but God made the water stand upon themselves while they walked across the river Jordan. They got across. The first battle they fought was the Battle of Jericho. Do you remember what happened on that seventh day when they walked around, they marched around the city seven times, and when they marched around the seventh time, what did they do? You need to know what they did. They blew the trumpets. When they blew the trumpet, the walls came down. Uh, the, the blowing of the trumpet points to the New Testament when the gospel is preached. When the power of God is preached with power, things happen in people's lives. The walls came down. You know what? Archaeologists have found that something unusual happened in the city of Jericho. That old city of Jericho is still in ruins. Now, picture this. If you have a city with ancient walls around it, if those walls were to fall down, which direction would you suspect that they would fall? Would you expect that they would fall outward because of the way they're built? The wall, but how do you? But those walls fell inward against nature. God has power over nature to make things happen that is absolutely extraordinary. Those walls fell inward. That tells me that there is no wall that God cannot make come down. Whatever your trouble is, whatever the adversary throws at us, God has the power to defeat it. Now, strongholds. You know, in the past, our military has built forts. The army even still calls their military stations forts. Fort this and fort that and fort the other. Because that comes from the old uh, language where they actually built a wooden fort or a stone, stone fort uh, for the troops to get inside and defend themselves. That's, that was called a stronghold. Uh, they also called the place where they put the, put the ammunition a stronghold. They also called the place where they put their money the stronghold. They thought because it was supposed to be strong and to keep safe in there. So notice what he says here. He says, 
For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That's your enemy's strongholds. Now, for the sake of time, let me give you some strongholds today. Did you know that the abortionists have a stronghold in our country? They have laws to support them. Uh, uh, the militant sodomites, they have a stronghold in this country, and they're pushing their agenda. Uh, those, who want, uh, those who are greedy and desire a great power and glory to themselves, they have a stronghold. We have big parts of our government uh, that is a stronghold, and it, they just seem to can't crack it. They have their own agenda. They have their own philosophies. They have their own ideas, and they're pushing it upon everybody else and trying to override the will of the people. That's a stronghold, but let me tell you something. The will of God will prevail. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But let me tell you, the way, the way this battle is going to be won is for children of God put on the whole armor of God. I hope to get there in Ephesians chapter 6 in just a moment. That's the way this battle is. And you're soldiers, by the way. You know, a soldier ought to sit up and take notice. You know that? You know, a soldier takes up, uh, sets up and listens to his commander. All right, you military folks, say amen or something. Whatever you say, you say it. All right, because this is indeed a warfare, and if we don't put on the whole armor of God, my friends, we're going to go into the battle. We're going to lose. But when you go into battle and you put on the whole armor of God, uh, the weapons of our warfare will never fail. I've got great confidence in my God, don't y'all? I mean, he's never lost a battle. He's not going to lose this. Whether it's a battle in our individual lives, some trouble we're having, and I guarantee you, I know about your lives. I know, and I love you, and I know, and I love it. I know the difficulties you have, and my friends, we got troubles. But I want to tell you something: they are not; they they cannot defeat the army of God. They cannot defeat the weapons of God because God has power over every trouble that we have. Okay, in our country, those strongholds. I have confidence in God that those strongholds are coming down. I don't give up, and it's probably ignorance on my part sometimes. But when I see something is right. I'm like, like a mad dog after a ham bone. You ever seen that? That's old down the hall uh, talking. A mad dog after a ham bone. You know, you, know, you ever see? You, if you've ever seen that, that's, that's a sight to see. You take an old hound dog out there and a bunch of other old dogs out there. You take the ham bone that's been gnawed down to nothing on there. And you throw it out there in the yard. And that old mad hound dog is going to get that bone, isn't he? He's going to get it, and he's going to possess it, and he's going to take it away, and nobody else is going to take it from him. Uh, and so uh, that's good uh, if you're in the service of your God and keep Jesus Christ as our objective, our focus, and to take up our cross and follow him. By the way, when he says take up your cross and follow him, that means to be ready to suffer and to do without and to disadvantage yourself and even to harm yourself and, if necessary to serve him. That's what those, that's what those law enforcement officers down at Kissimmee did. Uh, they were uh, doing the will of God, protecting that community, because that is their God-given duty uh, to protect take the community, and they went out there and they gave their life. But I trust them by the God of glory and God of mercy that when that shot was fired, oh, they then looked in the face of the Lamb of God. God will lose the battle. He says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And then he says, Casting down imaginations. Casting down imaginations. You know, imagine it's something that people think up, something they think up, and they profess it to be true. They come up with some idea, and they say, this is true. Well, let me tell you something. There's only one truth. That's the Word of God. Jesus Christ told the Samaritan woman of the well, He said, Thou hast come in thy husband, the true worship shall worship the Father in spirit, and in what? Truth. Uh, it, it is our obligation to our God to worship Him in truth. There is a truth, and God spoke it. I believe that the King James translation of the Word of God is the true Word of God in the English language. I'll stand upon that as long as I have in power to stand. I believe that He's communicated His will to us, and that Word will stand. It's the true Word of God. So He says, casting down imagination. You know how you cast down an, uh, an imagination? An imagination is false, and what you do is present the truth. The truth. And where do you get the truth? You get the truth from the Word of God. I'll come back to that in a moment. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against 
uh, the knowledge of God. There are many today in our country, it's unbelievable, but there's many in our day who exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. They don't like to retain God in their knowledge. They want to, don't want to hear His name. They don't want to hear the Ten Commandments. They don't want anybody praying. They don't want anybody going to church. They don't want anybody calling out His name in glory and magnifying His name. They don't want anybody worshiping Him. But let me tell you something. Uh, the truth of God stands and that the children of God who love Him will be therefore steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's our challenge. That's our commandment. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That, that phrase means this, that Jesus Christ is going to win. As a matter of fact, in the book of Revelation, you see the Lord God Almighty riding on a horse. And do you know what? Do you know what's written on his, on his thigh? The Lord faithful. Faithful is his name. That means... You know, I, would, I want to be faithful. I do. I want to be totally reliable. But I can't. I mess up. Nothing else. I have to go into a hospital house, knee surgery, and I can't see about sick folks, can't check on folks. And so I fail naturally. But let me tell you something. Your Lord never fails. You can never call and He not hear. You can't present a problem to Him so big He can't solve it. Then verse number 6, he says, having in readiness to revenge all disobedience. He says, he says, you soldiers, in the service of your God, you always be ready. Paul, uh, Peter says in 1 Peter 3 and 15, uh, to uh, uh, be ready to give an answer to, to uh, everyone who asks a reason of the hope that is in you. That means be ready. Keep your sword sharp. How do you do that? You know... <clears throat> My guns aren't as clean as they ought to be. Now, I, I'm going to go home this evening clean them. Now, now, now that I think about it, uh, they need to keep them clean. But they, if there's one weapon that you must always keep clean, and let, let, let's turn over there and talk about it. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. i got three hours of preaching to do in 15 minutes, so pray for me. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, and verse number 10, he says, Finally, my brethren... There's two senses here I'm going to get to you. He says, everything I've said to you, this is the summation. This is the pinnacle point. He says, finally, my brethren. And he calls them my brethren because he loves them. So I like to call you all my brothers and my sisters because I love you. And, I, and I don't, when I say that, I don't say it loosely because I love you. I love you with the love that the Lord has given me for you, and we ought to love each other that way. So when we call each other brother and sister, we ought to mean it from our heart, and we ought to show it from, by our actions. We ought to mean it and show it by our actions. So he says, find me, my brethren. Notice what else he says. Be what? Are you following? Following your scripture. He says, be strong. Why do you need to be strong? Because there's a battle to fight. You have an enemy out there who's formidable, and you can't beat him. You can't win that battle with flesh and blood. You know you can't whip Satan with your own flesh and blood. The only way you can defeat him with, is with the weapons of our warfare that is given to us by the Lord God Almighty. But you take those weapons, and victory is assured every time. So he says, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Your strength is in the Lord. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ with strength. But be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might. So that tells me you don't have power. You don't have enough power to, uh, to tear down the strongholds. You don't have enough power to defeat the imaginations. You don't have a power to shut down the authorities and the powers uh, that, uh, that are over you. But... God does, and through the weapons that He gives you, victory is assured. Watch this now. Then He says, Put on the whole armor of God. Now that phrase means everything that God has given to you, put it on. Alright, so let's look at it this way. So the soldier's getting, go, re, getting ready to go to the battle. So he's gathering up all of his gear. He gets... Um, he gets all of his ammunition, puts his ammunition belt on, get everything in there, walks out and doesn't have his rifle. How effective do you think he's going to be on the battlefield? Or he walks out there with his rifle and forgets his ammo. How effective is he going to be on the battle? 
How effective will you be on the battle if you don't go into battle of life with a, the whole armor of God? That's the reason Paul says the whole armor. He says it more than once. The whole armor of God. You need the whole thing. It's important. Now watch this. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That word stand means to face the devil and stand and not compromise. It not be destroyed on the battlefield. You need to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Notice he didn't say against his cannons, against his rifle, against his sword, but the wiles. That means his tricks, his devices. The devil is the subtle of all, most subtle of all beasts. He'll sneak up on you. He'll get in your heart. He'll get in your mind. And he'll do everything he can to ruin your peace and your joy in this life. He will get in your families. He will get in your workplace. He'll get in the schools. And you know what? He'll even get in the church. One of the... One of the, the Lord's disciples, own apostles, had a devil. He's sly. And he'll trick you. He'll make you think everything's all right. When he came to Eve, let me show you how slick he is. When he came to Eve, let's go back, and I know I've quoted this before, but just bear with me. When, in Genesis chapter 2, when God put uh, Adam in the garden, he says, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Okay. Do you suppose that God meant what he said? Do you suppose that Adam understood what he said? Yep, I do. I sure do. But the serpent talking to Eve said, Well, God doth know that you will not die. Now, Satan told both the truth and the lie. That's what that's that's his trickery. He can come up with devices. He tells both the truth. Well, the truth was that Adam and Eve was not going to fall down naturally dead that day. But that's not that's what not the death that God was talking about. They did die that day. They died to their peace the close relationship with the Lord. They died to the benefits of the garden. The word death means to be separated from. They were separated from the peace. That's the peace that Jesus Christ himself came to restore. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 1. They lost it that day and they died to it. And they, they were so ashamed of themselves that they tried to make clothing out of fig leaves. Now that's bad. <laughs> that is real bad. But God, being the gracious and merciful God, made them clothes from animal skins. So, the wiles of the devil. Okay, if I'm not going to die, well, that, that fruit looks good. If I'm not going to die, I think I'll just go ahead and try it. If I'm not going to die, maybe, maybe God just, just misspoke. And, and maybe God didn't get it just right. Maybe, 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 maybe he just misinterpreted him. Maybe Adam didn't relate it to me exactly right. And, and that fruit looks so good. If we're not going to die, it just looks so good. We're going to try. That's the way Satan does. Satan gets the children that way. Gets the children. Mom and dad told children, don't do that now. Just, you just don't do that. But Satan says, well, what's wrong with it? Everybody else is doing it. It looks so great. It looks so good. And so well, let's, let's you know, just try some of this. And then one day I get a phone call. Brother Stanley, my son's in prison. My daughter's in prison. What am I going to do? I contact them and make contact with them in prison. And sometimes they say, I don't know how I got in such trouble. Well, I know how you got in trouble. You broke the law. People get hooked on drugs. I don't know how that happened. Well, I know how. You took something you weren't supposed to take. Let me tell you something. The devil has no morals, has no love, and he will ruin, he does everything in his power to ruin your life, to ruin the lives of your children, he'll ruin your government, he'll ruin your church, he will do everything in his power to ruin anything that is good. But I ain't giving up. I'm not going to roll over and play dead. 
I want us to put on the whole armor of God. This is a war, and I want to fight it. And I fight it with the prospect that the Lord God uh, uh, Almighty is on the battlefield. He's mighty to save, and victory is assured. You have that positive attitude this morning? I, I, won't hear, I ain't going to go until I hear something better than that. All right. My God is mighty to save, and he never loses a battle. The Paul says, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand. He says, this is how you stand against the wiles, the devices, the tricks, the lies, the deceit of the devil. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle. That is, we struggle, we fight, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Your real battle is not against the heads of these organizations. That's not your real battle. Listen to what he says. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of what? The ruler who rules the darkness, by the way? The devil himself. Against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And how does spiritual wickedness get to you know how spiritual wickedness gets in high places in our country? The children of God go to sleep on the job. Amen. We've been asleep too long. He says, therefore, because that is true, therefore take unto you the whole armor of God. Number two, therefore take unto you the whole armor of God you need. You're a, this is a war. We are engaged in war. There's a battlefield in this life. This is spiritual warfare. And your enemy is not flesh and blood. So you're not going to defeat him with flesh and blood. But victory is assured because we're to take unto ourselves the whole armor of God. God never tells you to do anything you cannot do. You know why? Because he will give you the power to do it. If he commands you to do it, he will give you the power to do it. Amen? All right. But on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand. That means Satan is going to throw things at you. He's going to discourage you. He's going to make life miserable. He's going to make you angry. He's going to make get you confused. He's going to do all of these things to you. He's going to hurt you in your body. He's going to hurt you in your mind. He's going to hurt you in your family. He's going to hurt you in your community. He said, but Paul says, you put on this whole armor of God, and you can stand it. You can withstand it. You can stay on the battlefield and keep going forward. He says that the, you may be able to withstand in the evil day, the bad day, when bad things are happening. You know, the modern Christian philosophy is that if you have accepted Jesus Christ, you won't have any evil days. You know, there's one problem with that. It just ain't so. Let me give you an illustration. Did Jesus Christ get it all right? Did he ever have a bad day? He sure did. What about Stephen? Did Stephen preach the truth? Yes, he did. Did he have a bad day? He did until the Lord opened up heaven to him. What about the Apostle James? He was killed with a story. I could go on and on and on. The idea that if you're following Jesus Christ, that life is going to be a breeze and you won't have any trouble is a lie. As a matter of fact, when the Lord says, take up your cross and follow me, that means be ready to suffer. So the point is, is Jesus Christ worthy of our suffering in this life? Is he worthy of us taking up our cross and following him? My friends, he is worthy because I look at me and I find no worthiness in me. I find no reason within me that my Jesus should have given his life for me. But he did because he's loved me with a great love. And one day I look forward to seeing him with mine own eyes and not that of another. And behold him in glory forever and ever and ever. I rejoice in it. Not because of my worthiness, but because... Of his worthiness. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all. Having done everything that God has commanded you to do. This is one of those cases. We need to hear the commandments of God and do them. And then he says in verse number 14. Are you ready? Stand. Get on the battlefield. Stand your guard. Stand your position. Take your place. And so, so, folks, I've had people tell me, I don't know where my place is. Well, every military guy has 
has got to read the manual, right? <laughs> you know, that is drudgery. Ain't that true? Manuals and regulations and books and rules and orders and all that kind of... Uh, and, you know, whenever you're, you change station, you have a, a set of orders, right? Y'all remember those? Those orders? And where those orders tell you to be, you better be right there. And when you're told to be there, right? Well, you've got a set of orders. And you've got it in your hands. You want to know where you're supposed to be? Right. And if you're looking for the details... A little prayer from time to time don't hurt either. Lord, what would you help me to do today? All right. So he says, stand therefore. Go into the battle. Take your position. Stand therefore having your loins girt. You know, a soldier wore a girdle. I was in a place one time. I was taking a temper, temper, uh, similar subject. There's a lot of ex-military folks. And, and I asked the congregation, I said, how many of you folks, your ex-military folks, wore a girdle in the military? Back there in those days, you didn't talk like that to a military guy. I mean, it was such a World War II and Korean War and early Vietnam vets there. And the idea that a soldier would wear a girdle, you know, that, that was offensive. But I was behind the book, I, I book board. I, I was pretty safe, I, I felt like. But in those days, you know, the belt that... Military folks wear, wear that has their ammo in it and has uh, supplies, food, and the pack that they wear on the back that has uh, a couple of days' supply of food and those kind of things. That was called a girdle. That's where you put your supplies. So he says, stand therefore having your loins girt about with, with what? Are you reading with me? Does truth matter? Does truth matter? That's the first point he makes. He says, your first weapon that you need to learn about is the truth. There is a truth, and there's a lie. There's a truth. He says, you put in your girdle, in your supply packet, you put the truth. The truth is, my friends, that the God that we worship is the sovereign, eternal, holy Lord God Almighty. That God, before the foundation of the world, made choice of a great number of people, and He determined that He would not lose a single one, but because He knew that we would sin, He sent His only begotten and beloved Son of this world to give His life for them, and He died for them, and of all that the Father had given Him, how many has He lost? Nothing. That's the truth. All right. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Defend yourself with right. And what is right? Is the, are the Ten Commandments right? Are they? And we, we all know to be a Paul said, we sang the song, I'm not ashamed to own my Lord. One of the parts of owning your Lord, now we're not going to go where some people take that. Y'all understand, we understand each other this morning. One of, the, one of the ways we own our Lord is to own His truth. Say, I love His truth. Like David said, I, I love Thy Word. I love Thy precepts. I love Thy commandments. He says, your Word, your commandments, are like in the 119th Psalm. It's like a, a lamp unto my feet. He said, I, I can see where I am in life. I, I can see uh, what my station, my position is in life. I know where I'm standing in life. He says, and it's a light into my path. He says, sometimes I'm not always standing where I ought to be in this life. But, I, I, but your word is a light into my path. It shows me where I ought to be going. My friends, every child of God that is born to the Spirit ought to be a member of the church of Jesus Christ and take up the cross and follow Him. All right? Every one of us ought to be like the Brian brethren, who were more noble than those of Thessalonica, in that they searched the Scriptures daily to see if these things be so. I wouldn't mind getting a phone call saying, Preacher, what do you mean by that? I wouldn't mind getting a phone call like that. Have your loins girt about with truth, and have put on, having on the breastplate of righteousness, the right things of God, and your feet shod. Everybody didn't wear shoes back there in those days. But a soldier had shoes on because he marched, he traveled, he went into battle. And also, many times the, the, uh, their shoes were actual weapons that they used on the battlefield. He says, in having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What is the gospel of peace? Boy, there's a lot of misinterpretation. Jesus says, you, well, you've heard that I come to bring peace. You think I came to bring peace? No. I came to bring division between families and, and, and friends and, and, and uh, uh, the communities. 
But the peace that he brought, my friends, the gospel of the good news of peace is that he came to bring peace between you and God Almighty. The peace that Adam destroyed, he came... In Romans chapter 5, Paul says, By one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. But by one man, one man brought life. Adam brought the sin, and death, and Jesus Christ, Christ brought life, eternal life with the Lord God Almighty. He, because he restored that peace. And because you have that peace... You can do some wonderful things when the troubles are great, when the wiles of the devil are oppressing you and, and burdening you and discouraging you. You can therefore now, Hebrews 4 and 16, because of what Jesus Christ has done for you, you can therefore now come boldly unto the throne of grace where you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of what? Need when the troubles are so great that you cannot overcome them. Jesus says, I can. Talk to me. The preparation of the gospel of peace. is good news of the peace. Verse number 16. Above all. Above all. He says, don't make sure. When you're putting on your armor, don't forget this one. He says, above all, taking the shield of faith. What is faith anyway? It is by your God-given faith that you know God. How do you know God? Everybody don't know God in a loving way. And you can't teach anybody to know God. I shall not, uh, every man shall not teach us ever to know God. But all the children of God, Jesus said, my sheep know me. John chapter 10, he said, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and them known of mine. And they, and they hear whose voice? His voice. They hear my voice. That means, that means we hear his voice speaking in our heart. Come unto me, all ye the labor. And are heavy laden. And I'll give you what? Rest. We hear that voice and rejoice in that voice. When you're facing the battles of life, you get you turn on the evening news and you just turn it right back off again because you're so frustrated and aggravated. Nobody. It seems that nobody is standing. Nobody's taking a good firm stand for the Lord God Almighty and His Word and His Gospel and His church. And you just get frustrated and you turn it off. That's what I do. And let me tell you something. When you come to that point, you turn to your faith. This says, well, I know that my Redeemer liveth. That's what Job said in the middle of his life. I know that my Redeemer, he hasn't left me alone. I'm not in this by myself. Yeah, like the apostles, the storm is raging. It looks like sometimes the ship is going down. But, but lift up your eyes and look and see. You see if you can't see the Lord come walking on the water in the midst of the storm. See if you can't hear his words when he says, peace be still. And a calm comes. That's the God that we worship. Our weapons are not carnal. That means they're not limited as we are in the flesh. Because Jesus Christ has only two limits. You know what those limits are? One is he cannot lie. He cannot lie. And he cannot sin. All right, quickly, very quickly now. He says, above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. That means, you know what a fire, it's like an arrow. You, you've seen those uh, old cowboy and Indian movies where the arrows will be fired and, be, and, and there'll be fire on the end of them. Can you see yourself sitting out on the battlefield and all of those fiery arrows coming at you? You know... The way I'm thinking right now is I'd be the first one to run. But a soldier's got to stand his position. He's got to stand his post. And when we got this shield on, it'll deflect the fiery darts of the devil. Then he goes on. It, well, let's, let's apply. I know it's after 12. So I've already gone on. Once you've already fell off, fallen off the wagon, you, you're off. So I've already gone over 12. So just give me another minute or two. Okay. When you hear on the news, when you hear on the news that um, that the schools can't pray anymore, that children get to get together at school and pray, when you hear such as that, 
and that everybody's got to accept sodomy, and that everybody's got to accept abortion, when you hear all of that, and the government is pressing it, and your money is even paying for it, when you hear that, and you want to just, like it's no use. I, I, I can't, I, I, the problem's too big. The organizations are too mighty. They're too ingrained. You, you just can't overcome them. You know, Satan loves it when he gets you to that point. That's when we stand up and we say, Well, my Lord's on the battlefield. Did like Midian, uh, like the Midianites were defeated when, uh, when, um, uh, when they were like a, a grasshoppers in the field, and Gideon had this, uh, just 300 men, and they won that battle that day, like the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea. The same God is on his throne today. I'm not conceding any territory. Not one bit. He says, and take the helmet of salvation. That right there, that right there is a matter of great hope. The helmet of salvation, you know what it means? that means the Lord can save you from any trouble that you have. But what if you die? What if you do die? I'm going to tell you something. That thief on the cross with the Lord, he won that day. Because when the sun went down that day, where was he? In paradise with his Lord. The Lord said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Right now. The Spirit of the Lord, when he gave up the ghost, his Spirit ascended to paradise. And that thief... That thief, when he turned to me, he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. The Lord had grace and mercy upon that man and said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That day that man won the battle of life. He overcame by the grace of God. And then he says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Take this. Let this be your command. Your Lord is called a commander for a reason. He, he issues commands. And we're to be good soldiers, as Paul told Timothy, in the army of our God. May God bless you, my prayer.